Dreadnoughts are cool and all, but they're just so pedestrian. If only there was some way to make them move a little bit faster. Giant slingshot? No, too heavy. Ooh, roller skates. Hilarious, but again, no. I've got it. What? Rocket boosters. I need a thousand of these by Monday. Welcome to Hobby with Ollie, where this week we're going back to Blood Angels. This time we're taking on the Contemptor Incaendius Dreadnought, aka What If Dreadnought But Flying. I've put this one off for a little while, as first off this was a gift, and secondly it's Forge World Resin, which as you probably know doesn't come cheap, so I really didn't want to mess it up. Fortunately, I'm really pleased with the results, so let me get straight into how I painted this guy. One of the things about Forge World Resin is that it's a little bit of a pain to stick together. Firstly, you can't use any plastic glue, so no covering up any unseemly mould lines by melting the plastic together. And secondly, you have to make sure you scrub all the parts with warm soapy water to make sure you get off that pesky mould release agent to make sure that all your paint is going to stick nicely to your model. Once I painstakingly scrubbed every single piece and then stuck it together with super glue, I went on to priming. I'm starting from a black primer, as this is normally my preferred method to give me a really consistent colour scheme. You can do a white primer and it's going to make the colours pop a bit more, but there's more possibility of leaving parts out or for there to be inconsistency in the paint job. When I was priming the claws, I realised that I actually hadn't done a good enough job of my scrubbing. You can see here that the paint is not adhering to the resin as it should be. Fortunately, I caught this early on and it was only on a small part of the model, so I went over to the bathroom, sorted it out, gave him a bit of a rinse, and then came back to priming. The next step was establishing the deepest shadow colour, which for my Blood Angel scheme is a mahogany from Vallejo. This is a nice, deep, warm brown tone, which really helps to set the tone for the colours that go on top. You'll also notice that I managed to get my hands on some nitrile gloves to use while airbrushing to avoid those pesky fingerprints and mostly just to look really professional on camera. Unfortunately, I managed to completely break the illusion by sticking my finger to the base of this guy as I was trying to super glue him on. So there's now a little bit of plastic glove stuck to the bottom of this guy's foot. What can you do? It fortunately doesn't show up too much later on, so I'm not too worried about it, but I'll probably be taking more care with super glue and nitrile gloves in the future. With the claws freshly dry from their bath and painted black, I then went over with gunmetal from Vallejo, and I thought I might as well do this with the airbrush, as the whole thing is going to be silver, and also it's going to avoid any streaking that might come from doing this with a paintbrush. Speaking of things I kept separate, I also glued the head to an old paint pot for focus later. This is why you'll see people keep the head separate so they can get at all the small details before attaching it to the model. When painting any model, it's important to draw attention to the face area, as it's the first place that anyone's going to look when they start looking at your model. Right, it's time to give this blood angel his red livery. I sprayed Vallejo red, avoiding the recesses where possible, and I applied multiple layers of this to the higher up areas. This is going to intensify the red colour and give a bit of a gradient to the red armour. I love using the airbrush, particularly for applying these base coats, but the same effect is still possible with a brush. It's just going to take really thin down paint applied as glazes from dark to light. To go one step further, I did the same, but this time with Evil Sun Scarlet, thinned down to an air paint consistency with airbrush thinner. This was only used on the shoulders and upper chest. Now on to some brushwork. I started with the gold inlays and patterning all over the model. This can be a bit fiddly, but my advice would be not to overload your brush and to use the side of the brush wherever possible. There are still some parts that are going to require a bit of fine brush control, but so long as you keep them to a minimum by accessing the easy to reach areas with the side of the brush, it's going to be much, much less effort when you get to those difficult parts. At this point, I noticed that some of the paint was chipping off as I was working. This is particularly prone to happening on resin models. So I first sorted out the chips by applying the colours that had gone on before, and then went in with Munitorum varnish in order to make sure that the paint does not chip off anymore. This gives it a protective layer which stops my grubby fingers from scrubbing off the paint that I've worked so hard to apply. With the layer of varnish in place, I was confident being able to move the model around in my hands, and to paint Evil Sun Scarlet Edge highlights around the armour panels near the top of the model. Adding some more gold trim around the armour panels, I next went about attaching the claws, which ended up being a little more difficult than expected, as it was quite a tight squeeze to get them attached. Yet more gold trim, and then it was time to paint some black armour panels, which were simply painted with a pattern black. Now I can focus on the head, and following the reference image from the packaging, I painted black on the bottom section and retributor armour for the top part of the helmet. I washed over the gold using Seraphim Sepia. Next were some little gunmetal details. 
These included the eyes, and then I applied a grey highlight to the black area of the helmet. With Vallejo Aluminium, I added a brighter spot to the eyes, which I then went over with Waystone Cream. As I now had some gunmetal ready to go, I used this on all the metal back areas of the Dreadnought. As I wanted to avoid it looking too samey, I also used a bit of Vallejo Copper here for the top part of the backpack. I also used this for some pipes on the awesome rocket engine. We're on to the last couple of details now, but just a quick note to say thank you very much for watching, and remember to like the video if you are enjoying it. You can also subscribe to the channel if you like what I'm doing, but just watching the videos is by far the best thing you can do for a small content creator like me, so thank you so much for watching this far, you guys are awesome. With all that sentimentality out of the way, let's get back to painting this epically unsafe machine of war. While I was painting the gold, I realised I'd missed the area around the claws, so I painted these up. Next came what I hoped would be the final assembly, super gluing all the parts in place. Gradually over the painting process, he'd been falling apart, but as this allowed me easier access for painting, I didn't worry about it until now. Once he was all stuck together, I painted non oil thickly over all the metals. Dulling down the metals can be quite helpful to draw the attention to the areas of the model that I actually want you to look at, like the red armor panels and the gold, which I'll come on to now. For the gold, I wanted to make sure that it drew people's attention, so I was careful in my application of Seraphim Sepia, keeping it into the deepest recesses. Agonizingly, now that the messy part of shading is done, I now have to try and insert the head of the model into that tiny little gap, um, which is a real problem that you have with Contemptor Dreadnoughts. Applying a blob of superglue to the bottom of the head, I used tweezers for a bit of extra control and slotted it into place. To further the used nature of the metals, I shaded over with Agrax Earthshade, focusing this around joints, nooks and crannies in the machinery. The final detail was the red gem on his chest. I started off using Vallejo Red, and then painted a sort of J shape using Evil Sun Scarlet covering the right side of the gem. Next, to this paint I added Fluorescent Orange, a colour that I picked up for my Necromunda video, which you can see yeah. I'm interested in seeing how it plays with other paints, and I will say I quite like it for these gems. I next used the fluorescent orange on its own for the top right quarter of the gem. Lastly, I added a couple of dots of Wraithbone before applying a layer of Ardcoat Gloss Varnish to give it a nice shine. And so this absolutely insane creation is ready to take to the battlefields and even more improbably to the skies of my Horus Heresy games. Thanks as always for watching this episode of Hobby with Ollie. I release new videos every Sunday on a variety of Warhammer and miniature wargame related stuff. So be sure to check out those other videos if you haven't done so already. Until the next one, my name has been Ollie, this has been my hobby, and I'll see you next time.